Now we're going to get, start, to get started, and Charles Taylor is going to introduce the panelists. Uh, but I'm going to just make a couple of points about Taylor. He's actually a deputy controller of the OSEC, and he's in charge of uh, capital and regulatory policy. And prior to that, um, he was in charge of financial reform project at Pew Trust. Charles. Thank you very much, Lema. Um I'm never sure why the regulators get put at the end of these conferences. I think it's because you know, you've had your desserts and now you need to take your pill. Uh, but we'll try, and, we'll try and make it worthwhile. I, it's my pleasure to introduce the panel. Uh, my immediate left is uh, Dick Berner, Councillor to the Secretary of the Treasury, Office of Financial Research, then uh, missing today uh, in action. We hope he'll be here in time to speak as Andrei Kirilenko, uh, Chief Economist at the Commodities and Futures uh, uh, Trading Commission. Uh, Craig, Lewis is, uh, Craig Lewis is uh, Chief Economist and Director of the Division of Risk, Strategy and Financial Innovation at the Securities and Exchange Commission. And then at the end of the row is Art Merton, who's Director of uh, Division of Insurance and Research, FDIC. And a few other things as well, I think, Art, aren't you? Yeah, but anyway, yeah, give me your business card and I'll get it straight. Good, that'll do, that'll do, good. So what we're going to try and do is give you a sense of where we are in creating the new capacity to monitor, analyze, and manage systemic risks. And we'd also like to hear your issues and concerns. Um, uh, each panelist is going to have about 10 minutes um, to give some introductory remarks. Uh, Dick's going to kick off with uh, progress in standing up OFR and how FSOC and interagency cooperation is, and collaboration is going more generally. Um, uh, Andre will uh, hopefully take us through some of the specifics around uh, LEI and UPI, uh, loss, uh, I want to say loss, I, I've got losses on the brain from working at the OCC. Um, uh, legal entity identifiers and universal product identifiers, uh, semantics, machine readability and storage and retrieval and how these work, uh, work on these efforts fits in with rulemaking and standards. Uh, I think Craig is going to talk about swap data repositories and aspects of shadow banking. Um, and Art's going to be talking a bit about the uh, new resolution authority in DFA and its importance and the importance there of LEI and uh, exposure data for the FDIC. So we have a fairly full agenda. Um, if you can hold your questions and comments to the end, we'll uh, hopefully uh, get through um, introductory remarks and have plenty of time for some dialogue. So with that, Dick, off to you. Thanks very much, and thanks to the organizers uh, for having us all here. Um, and I, I think Charles is right. Um, you know, we're supposed to leave you with uh, some sobering thoughts. Uh, but we also want to leave you with some uplifting thoughts about the progress that we're making in trying to promote uh, financial stability, uh, not only in the United States markets and in our institutions, but, uh, but across the globe. Um, so, uh, what are the, what's the progress we're making with that in setting up institutions uh, to do that? Uh, as many of you know, uh, the Dodd-Frank Act uh, mandated two new institutions. Um, first was the Financial Stability Oversight Council, uh, and second was the Office of Financial Research. Um, the Financial Stability Oversight Council uh, is a collaborative body, and I think the collaboration part of it is, is absolutely essential because it consists of all the um, member agencies that uh, have regulated different parts of our financial system, uh, eight to be specific, an insurance expert appointed by the president, state regulators, and some other non-voting members, including the director of the Office of Financial Research. And the purpose is to identify threats to financial stability, uh, to respond to those threats and develop policy tools uh, to mitigate them and structure to mitigate them and to promote uh, market discipline. That's what's written in the statute, and I think the framers got it right. Uh, those are uh, very appropriate goals. Remember, these uh, agencies haven't really uh, worked all that closely in the past. Clearly, there's been collaboration, but the whole point was instead of ripping up our regulatory structure and starting from scratch, uh, we wanted to take the existing structure uh, and promote collaboration. And um, I think that uh, as kind of a preliminary comment, uh, it's fair to say that uh, my colleagues on the podium here, I think, would agree that the collaborative process is well underway. Uh, there are a lot of wrinkles to iron out, for sure, but, uh, but that process really is, uh, is working, uh, I think, as intended, and it's going to proceed uh, over time. 
The FSOC has uh, certain authorities, one of which is to designate non-bank financial companies for uh, heightened prudential supervision. Second is to designate financial market utilities for heightened prudential supervision by both by the Federal Reserve uh, and to look at uh, certain financial activities uh, that those institutions engage in as something we ought to keep on our radar screen, whether they involve payment clearing or settlement activities, all that's important. I think that uh, the focus, uh, importantly, is shifting away from a bank-centric and institution-centric focus towards one that it looks across the financial system. After all, that's really what macroprudential uh, supervision and oversight uh, is all about. So the uh, organization, the FSOC, is designed uh, to promote uh, coordination on regulation and to try to reduce the burden by reducing duplication uh, and uh, conflicts uh, among regulations to share information and collection, so reduce the reporting burden uh, on institutions. That's a pretty tough sell. I just came from speaking in front of a bunch of, uh, uh, of attorneys for various uh, financial institutions uh, and selling the idea that uh, we're going to reduce the reporting burden uh, is, uh, as you can imagine, a tough sell, and the burden of proof is clearly on us uh, to do that. Um, the FSOC is required to a report to Congress annually. We published, the FSOC published its annual report in July. The Secretary of the Treasury is chair of the FSOC, and uh, this morning at 10 o'clock he testified in front of Congress uh, reporting on uh, the results from that report as well as the recommendations uh, from that report. So I won't go over those because you can find his testimony. But as evidence of the, um, the collaborative process, uh, we set up five committees uh, to, uh, to promote that process within the FSOC. Uh, there's a deputies committee that gets, you know, the work done for the principals. There's a systemic risk committee uh, that's charged with driving the agenda for thinking about factors that affects financial stability. There are two designation committees, one for non-banks, one for financial market utilities. Uh, there's a committee for heightened prudential standards that the Fed drives. Um, there's a orderly liquidation authority and resolution plan committee. Uh, that's obviously uh, the primary responsibility of the FDIC, uh, but it's designed to collaborate on that. And there's a data committee, uh, which the OFR chairs to, uh, to promulgate better collection of data. So what is the OFR? Well, the OFR is uh, uh, the new entity also that's designed to uh, help the FSOC in, in pursuing those goals uh, to uh, measure and analyze factors affecting financial stability and to work with other FSOC member agencies to develop the policies they need to, uh, to promote it. And importantly, the OFR isn't going to duplicate the efforts that are going on uh, at other member agencies. The OFR is going to try to look for the gaps, both in research and data, and to help coordinate uh, some of those things that, uh, you know, that will help promote better sharing of information, better sharing of ideas. Uh, I would mention along those lines that right after this, uh, uh, this session is over, uh, we'd be kicking off the first of our, um, of our workshops uh, on looking at factors that affect financial stability. Uh, and Paul Glasserman, who's working with us sitting in the audience, and Mark Flood uh, sitting in the audience, uh, are organizing those workshops. Uh, the first speaker is Enrico Perotti from the uh, University of Amsterdam and the Dutch Central Bank. Um, and Mark and Paul will uh, be happy to be the Pied Pipers and lead those of you who have registered for that workshop to, uh, you know, to go over there uh, at our, uh, our building in the, in the Treasury. Importantly, we're, uh, we're collecting data uh, that um, we haven't had before. So how do we identify which data we need to collect? Well, first we have to take stock of the data that we have, whether they're purchased, whether they're collected by us or other uh, parts of the Financial Stability Oversight Council. So the first thing to do is to take stock of those data, and that process is, uh, is underway. And as you can imagine, with you know, eight financial regulators, that in itself is a, is a fairly extensive and, and big job. Uh, we started with easy stuff, the data that we purchased from outside uh, vendors. Uh, we're looking for uh, then to go to the next level uh, to look at the data that we collect and that we, uh, as part of the reporting process, that are publicly available. And last, uh, we'll look at the data that uh, all of us on a supervisory basis collect 
And of course, we, uh, we will not share confidential data, but we're going to take a look at those supervisory data and see uh, which of them can be um, used uh, both within the, uh, across the FSOC uh, and masked and, and appropriately safeguarded so that research, the research community will be able to use more of the data that they haven't had access to uh, in the future. The OFR is required also to report to Congress on a periodic basis and to publish uh, an annual report, one that will complement uh, the report that the FSOC put out uh, in, uh, in July. Uh, and that will have a lot of analytical content uh, and um, talk about uh, more and update people on uh, how we see the world, uh, where we see the biggest threats. Uh, and uh, not necessarily what we propose to do about them because that's the responsibility of the FSOC, but it's clearly our responsibility to bring that to the attention of the FSOC and its principles. Um, when we think about uh, the way we want to collaborate, um, there are at least four constituencies that the OFR uh, needs to collaborate with. It's pretty clear that we need to form a partnership with uh, the financial institutions from whom we're collecting data, while at the same time not being subject to regulatory capture. So we have to uh, make that make good on that proposition that we're going to reduce the reporting burden. We propose to do that by standardizing data uh, through, among other factors, the so-called Legal Entity Identifier Initiative, and that's a very important initiative that I'll speak about just in, in a moment. Uh, it's also clear that we need to collaborate with the global regulatory community so that we understand what they're doing uh, in terms of collecting data and promoting research uh, to, and to establish standards uh, for those data. Third, we need to collaborate with uh, data vendors, aggregators, uh, and consolidators, the people who are in the business of collecting data because we're not trying to disintermediate or disenfranchise them. Uh, indeed, uh, we want to make sure that their business models are intact uh, and that uh, the data that we provide actually help them uh, in, uh, in conducting their business. And last, uh, but not least at all, we need to collaborate with uh, the research community to make available more and better data, to share ideas, uh, and in that regard, uh, I think it's very important to note that, yes, we'll be conducting research uh, in the OFR. Uh, we will um, share uh, with us other FSOC member agencies and try to fill the gaps uh, in research and working with them through the various committees, uh, try to uh, make sure that uh, there are projects going on that, that share ideas with some of my colleagues here on the podium uh, and uh, with others uh, who are not represented uh, here today. Our intention is to create a, a virtual research community. So the message that I want to leave those of you who are in academia with is that we need your students. We want to encourage them to come work in the OFR. Uh, we want to encourage you to work in the OFR if you're interested in coming and working uh, on a part-time basis. So Paul, I think, is a good example of that. Paul's a professor at Columbia, and he's working with us to help us uh, fulfill one of our mandates, which is to promote best practices in financial, research, uh, uh, financial risk management uh, and to set up the practice that enables us uh, to do that, uh, as well as our, our practice in statistics. Uh, and we would encourage uh, people who are interested in working with us to come work with us for a while uh, or to collaborate uh, with us. Let me wrap it up by talking just a, for a minute or two about the Legal Entity Identifier Initiative. That is an effort to uh, uniquely and precisely identify parties to a financial transaction. Um, and it sounds like something that's from Big Brother. But the fact of the matter is that uh, the financial services industry uh, long ago has been calling for such an identification system and has gone a long way in, in many respects to try to create those identification systems themselves. But it's like the railroads uh, in the early part uh, of the 19th century. You had different gauges, you had different people operating them, there were no standards, there was no rules of engagement, uh, and people recognized very quickly that if they were going to build the transcontinental railroad, that they needed to have some standards put in place. By way of analogy, the same is true uh, for collecting data at the most granular level. If we're going to identify financial transactions and the parties to them, uh, then we need to have some precise identification uh, of those parties. And that's simply put what this standard is designed to produce. It's going to be something that unfolds over years. The industry is already developing it. 
in many respects uh, in-house and on their own. And so we want to translate what they're doing uh, into the global standard that we're trying to, prom to promote. The industry will develop the operational aspects of this. Uh, what we uh, are trying to promote is a global standard and governance around it uh, so that people can have confidence that they will be able uniquely to identify uh, parties to a financial transaction and ultimately to identify uniquely uh, as well financial products. And those things are required under the statute. We were required to publish, publish reference databases uh, containing those things. Uh, and uh, that's going to be important, particularly for two of my colleagues up here as they promote regulations related to the data that are collected in SDRs, TRs, uh, and for over-the-counter derivatives. And they'll be putting, putting out regulations, I think, at the end of this year regarding that. But the LEI is going to be a, a part of the standards uh, in that uh, data collections process. So I'll leave it there. And uh, hopefully, we'll get some good questions. Good. Thank you very much. Uh, Andre. Thank you. I have a set of slides, so I'll just step out. It'll be easier if I can. So uh, thank you very much for, for having me here. It's, uh, it's a great pleasure. I'd like to thank the organizers for, uh, for putting it together. Last time we met, uh, a few months ago, we were sitting uh, downstairs in a much smaller room with a lot fewer people. And as you can see now, we probably have you know, you know, three times the size of the room and five times the number of people here, which is definitely a great sign and, and um, speaks a lot about, about the organizers, about the effort. But uh, I think the big momentum behind this interest in, in what we're doing here is also the Dodd-Frank Act. You know, the Dodd-Frank Act is, is the driving force that makes a lot of us work on on the issues of systemic risk and the, on the issues of, of data, which of course stems from the, from the financial crisis that we uh, experienced. So last time we met uh, uh, in, in March, uh, a, a lot of the uh, discussions were sort of about sort of a pie in the sky in terms of data. Here's what we'd like to have, here's what we'd ideally like to, this data to represent. This time we're meeting six months later and we are uh, still a bit talking about pie in the sky, but a lot of it, we already know the ingredients of what that pie sort of would have. So what I'd like to focus my, uh, my discussion on is on what we've done in terms of on, on a more granular level, in, in terms of, again, the ingredients and how we, uh, we plan to go about uh, figuring out what sort of data we need to have and, and, and what, what we'd like to... Uh, Collect. So uh, we, uh, uh, at, at the CFTC, I, I would just say, so we first started out with a mandate. So we're, we're you know, government agencies, so we need, to, uh, uh, we need to have a mandate to do what we do. We need to have a mandate to collect things. We need to have a mandate to, uh, to spend resources to, uh, to do the analysis or to publish things and that sort of thing. So the, the uh, mandate, uh, so, in some form, the mandate came from Congress initially and in part of the uh, uh, Dodd-Frank Act, which uh, mandated CFTC and the SEC to look uh, at the algorithmic, it was called algorithmic descriptions of derivatives contracts, so machine-readable definitions of, of contracts, and identify areas whether or not these definitions uh, should be mandated, so the so-called 719B study. So once we finished the 719B study and, and presented recommendations to Congress, what we've internally also done is that we said, look, you know, we've, we've done the study, Congress mandated that we do it, uh, but we think there is a lot more to it. We think that what we identified is, uh, is a set of recommendations that we need to uh, move forward on, and uh, we need to see how the Dodd-Frank Act could serve as a catalyst for us to really put the industry, the derivatives industry, on a much more solid 21st century technology. Because think about it, you know, we have, you have an industry that is, you know, trades 21st century risk management products but operates 19th century telephone technology. That's just not right, right? So you need to have a, you need to build a base behind it that would really put it on a technologically much qualitatively different footing. And uh, what are the areas that uh, 
that, that we were started identifying is, is, is the areas we reached out to the industry and, and started to build this subcommittee on, on data standardization as our technology advisory committee. And we formed four working groups that uh, uh, out of 22 uh, market participants. And we have on this, uh, on the subcommittee, uh, you know, Google, uh, together with Goldman Sachs, together with Bloomberg, uh, together with BlackRock. And these are chief information officers. So these are the people who actually build and implement uh, uh, standards and, and data requirements for their organizations as they see Dodd-Frank mandating them. So we uh, split it into four different areas. And the four different areas are entity and product ID and uh, machine readable legal documents. A lot of these contracts are are in only human readable form, uh, semantics and ontology, and storage and retrieval. And uh, the idea here is that uh, we'd like to uh, serve as a catalyst for a lot of the uh, things that the industry would sort of think the benefit and do in, but there are disparate sort of private interests pulling, pulling different participants apart. And like we'd like to be able to pull it together and put it some sort of a track that there is a common solution, common collaborative solution is found. So uh, uh, the uh, reports and recommendations, uh, preliminary reports and recommendations were presented last Friday. What I'll do is that I pulled out some slides from those reports and recommendations. These are not my slides, you know, just, just this one uh, and maybe the last one. And uh, I'll leave the slides with the organizers. They're just sort of hard to read. There, there's a lot of small font on them, so you'd be familiar with them. Also, the full decks of slides are on our, on our website. Uh, but this is just to give you an idea on a more granular level about what we think or where we think things are. So uh, group one, which worked on the, on the entity ID, actually made some proposals to, to uh, start issuing temporary, uh, temporary uh, IDs, uh, deliver 50,000 legal entity identification records that have been cleansed and validated uh, by June 2012. Uh, and assign this temporary reporting IDs and start the uh, start the process of building uh, the technology around it. What does it mean? Uh, what this means is that you know, let's say suppose you issued something. You have an you have a common identifier. Uh, industry needs to build and test uh, systems to do that. They'll need to build. Uh, proof of concept to see how it interacts with their existing system, run it through the tests, validate it. Then they need to build a beta uh, that is validated. Then they'll need to see how it works in production. So the uh, idea is that we don't want to wait for, oh, oh, this is what this group is proposing, not to wait for like you know the absolute best concept out there, uh, but to start uh, the phasing and testing and implementation uh, program now. Again, these are industry participants. These are their ideas and their, these are their recommendations. This subcommittee, this working groups make recommendations to the technology advisory committee and that committee makes recommendations to the commission and commission votes on the laws, on, on the rules of Dodd-Frank. So this is sort of an important channel uh, into, uh, on, on the industry side on how they sort of uh, start working in parallel without waiting for uh, uh, for, for the commission, uh, for, for, for the regulators to, uh, to do what they need to do. On the product ID, it's, it's a bit more complicated and further down the road. Again, I'll, I'll leave the slides. I don't, I'm not going to go through them in detail. But this is just to illustrate to you that there is a lot more effort that's already going into this, and it's on a lot more granular level than just, you know, let's come together and do something. Uh, what... Uh, what the idea here is is that uh, the uh, at, at the product ID the um, sort of the debate is or, or the uh, the discussions are at the level of uh, uh, you know finding and evaluating attributes that would be commonly acceptable uh, to the industry and then creating them um, uh, and, and then validating them and then maybe proceeding to the stage uh, to the stage where the legal entity identifier is. Uh, working group two with respect to machine readable legal documents uh, also made recommendations and the recommendations that they made are also to start with something that, that the, um, ISDA is already working on 
and conduct uh, and conduct different sort of environments for standardized products and bespoke products. Uh, and the idea here is that, so the main task that they have is that when would be the right time for, uh, to identify sort of the timeline, when would be the time to actually switch from human readable documents as the legal document underlying the contract to a machine re uh, readable document as a legal document. So that's the, that's the goal. So a, a lot of these goals are switching from human readable data, human readable documents, human readable systems to machine readable definitions. Everything is, you know, it, it should be done by, by algorithms and, and machines reading them uh, and humans validating those. Uh, so again, the proposed approach is, is, to, uh, is to evaluate the progressive path to that. So again, the questions have been asked and formulated, and there's already paths being created for doing that. The technology to do this does exist uh, to, convert, uh, to convert existing documents and future documents into, uh, uh, into machine-readable format, primarily using fixml, fixml type of uh, representation. Semantics and ontology, yesterday you've heard from, uh, from Wells Fargo about how they're working on um, on the semantics approach. So the group that we had uh, uh, is, is, not entirely, uh, um, is not entirely all there on semantics representation. They're quite there on an ontology and a dictionary, and a data dictionary representation. But semantics as a tool, even though it's made some, some very, very positive and, and, and important contribution in other fields, uh, is, is needs to be evaluated against what's already there. What's already there. What's already, what we already have is basically FPML protocol, and uh, one of the suggestions was to uh, to conduct a data gap uh, to, to conduct a gap analysis, basically uh, where it might be not sufficient, and maybe go into the uh, financial industry business ontology, or maybe go into augmentation of FPML with additional with additional attributes so it could, it could do what, what it could do. Because industry has built a lot of, uh, a lot of systems around, the, uh, uh, around FPML and around FIX uh, in terms of you know, conducting the message, and message traffic. So the idea is you know, if, if it could really be used in a cost-effective way and, and augmented to serve the purpose, uh, it may not be fast. Uh, it may not be as fast as, as possibly semantics would do it, but uh, it would again be doable, something that's doable, something that could be done, and something that we could, we could move on, on, on doing. Uh, the uh, work in group four in terms of storage and retrieval is something that we've added. So you, uh, and the main question that they ask is the following question. You have these two protocols for cleared and uncleared Derivatives for clear, do you have fixed, and for unclear, do you have FPML? There are a lot of reporting requirements coming onto the industry, and, and there are other requirements and in, in availability to mix and match and cross margin and report products that prior to now were cleared and unclear that, in terms of machine readability, exist in two different protocols. Uh, there should be a way to combine attributes from these two protocols. And in addition, there could be an architecture built to store this data. These are you know, enormous quantities of data that needs to be stored for long periods of time, and standards will change. And what do we mandate? So if it's retrieved for legal purposes, is it retrieved in the original uh, protocol that it was stored or not? Uh, so these are the questions that, that they're asking. Again, the purpose of this presentation is, is, uh, is, is to show you just sort of on, on the more granular level where we are thinking, uh, where we're going and how we're going about this. I'd like to, uh, uh, I'd like to uh, end it perhaps in the same, in the same way that, that Dick did, is that we sort of don't view ourselves as a, as a government agency as, uh, as an agency that will make it work. We more view ourselves as a catalyst. We will need to catalyze your effort, and lots and lots of people will need to make it work. 
And uh, we'd like to, I would also like to say, if, if you have students, if you have, if your faculty members reach out to any one of us, reach out to Dick, reach out to me, to Craig, uh, and just say, look, you know, I, I'd like to work on this. We'd like to work with whoever is interested, with the best talent, with whoever wants to put their effort behind this. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to change how these markets work. This happens, uh, every 80 years, uh, now is the time that it happened. And I, the fact that you're all here is, is evidence that you are at least in some way committed to this idea. Uh, there is, uh, there, you know, I'm hiring people now to join the office of the chief economist. And what I tell them is say, look, you know, if you can show to me that you can work on the paper that could be more important than working on the rules than we're promulgating, I'd like to see that. What is the piece of research that you could possibly be working on that is more important than changing the entire multi-trillion dollar industry now? So now is the time. This is what we've been training for. This is all of our training, all of our studying, everything we learned starting from you know, college is for this. So we could make an industry that works on the platform that serves the American and global public in the best way that it could serve. So uh, come reach out to any one of us and we'll put you to work. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. Um, before we proceed, uh, how are we doing for time? Do we, ha we started a little late. Can we go on a little late? We, we can go to noon. Does everybody agree? Yes, good, okay, on we go. Craig. Thank you, Charles. So, I'm Craig Lewis, <clears throat> I'm at the SEC, and I'm going to be talking a little bit about um, systemic risk and shadow banking, but I also want to take an opportunity to thank the program organizers. As I look out at the table, I realize that Chester is my predecessor at the SEC, and, like, and the lemma, many of you may not know, a lot of you do, is, was my dissertation chairman at Madison. Um, I think we have finally reached a point in our careers that if, to, if we were to be introduced to someone who wasn't aware of them, they would assume that I was the dissertation chairman and Lemma was actually the student. Uh, Lemma is ageless. I don't know how... So, but. <laughs> um, but I thought what I would do is, um, Charles said I'd be talking about sort of over-the-counter derivatives markets, and I, I plan to do that, but... I was here for yesterday afternoon's um, discussion about money market funds, and so I thought I would broaden the discussion just a little bit to talk about areas where the SEC collects data that informs the debate about systemic risk and shadow banking in particular. Um, I think one of the things that the SEC is very interested in getting a better handle on is essentially the opacity that exists around the shadow banking system and just financial markets in general. Um, when, wherever there's opacity, there is significant opportunities for firms to make money and to engage in actions that may create more risk for the economy than those profits are, are really worth thinking about in the aggregate. So as a regulator, it's important for us to take a look and understand those markets better. And so with respect to money market funds, the issue is, well, are they systemically important? And of course, the answer there is yes. That's provided, I think, that the industry actually survives for another couple years at the kind of yields that they're able to pay investors, right? The industry is shrink shrinking dramatically. And that's information that can really be obtained directly from public filings that the SEC makes available to everybody. I know that Russ used um, info data that came from iMoneyNet yesterday, but really what iMoneyNet is is a conduit, much like CompuStat, that takes available tagged filings that are up on the Edgar website. And that data is available both in a public and non-public way. The public data is essentially lagged by two months. Anybody that knows how to use tagged data and can write a script can download data that is almost contemporaneous, right? I think there's some discussion about why there's a lag in the data mainly used, but at the bottom line is the only thing that's non-public is we have access to data that is a little more recent than what we make available to everybody else. 
Nonetheless, you can use that data, and if you did use that data, you would find that there's been a dramatic outflow of funds from the industry. And one of the things I think is an interesting insight that I don't think gets a lot of attention in the debate around money market funds is the endogenous response that funds themselves have to exposure to certain types of systemic risk. So if you were to take that public data, what you would discover is that there is a lot of uh, reduction in exposures to pig's debt, for example, right? So funds endogenously respond to systemic concerns by taking those out and sort of trading out of those in their portfolio. I mean, that's not new information, it's a natural response, but there is a concern on the part of money market funds to do that. So the data that you get from Form N MFP is you get positions. You actually are able to identify the exact positions, the holdings of all money market funds that are available. So it's very complete data, allows a lot of very detailed and specific analysis. Um, the next thing I wanted to talk about, so think about the systemic risk related to that, and then another issue that has received a lot of attention that is currently a rule in the rule writing process and about is sort of gone from the proposing stage to almost and hopefully sometime soon the adopting stage is um, disclosures that relate to hedge funds and Form PF that's about to come out. Form PF will provide non-public data that will only be available for use by the SEC, but that data will provide information on for large um, hedge funds on a quarterly basis. And what we will get from that data set is aggregated positions. It will not be the, at, the, at the granularity of what we're able to obtain from money market funds, but nonetheless there will be significant financial disclosures that we will be able to use for internal purposes to identify systemically important financial institutions. So that is a, an, an interesting, I think, source of data that will come presumably when the rule is adopted and it doesn't get challenged in court. Um, so one of the, the things that I will be doing or that I think would be interesting to do with this data when it comes in is it will be a way of, I think, calibrating the quality of the data that's already available to academic researchers that comes from voluntary disclosure sources. I think um, Lippertas provides a database that is voluntary. Um, we have the CISDM database, which also provides voluntary information that's disclosed by hedge funds. Because it's voluntary, it's well documented in the academic literature that there are certain problems associated with that, namely the voluntary basis means that if you're doing well, you're happy to report, and if you're not doing so well, you tend to disappear from the database. Um, the other thing is, I know some of my colleagues at Vanderbilt have looked at sort of management of return performance around that and found evidence that returns are managed. There are very few small negative returns in that database. So what will happen, I believe, is that once those same firms are required to report to the SEC, you will find that they will upgrade the quality of the data that they're voluntarily reporting. So even if that data doesn't, isn't made available to the public, I believe that what you see in the public is likely to be of much higher quality simply because if the SEC notices a discrepancy, there's likely to be some type of an inspection of that particular entity. So it seems stands to reason that that's a cost that they will bear, which will lead, reduce them to provide higher quality data that you can use for your own research purposes. So those are two important data sources. And the last one I wanted to talk about is what's going on in the OTC derivative space. Um, what the SEC is, is allowed to look at is the space that we get to regulate in. So we are currently receiving non-public data from DTCC, which is basically the equivalent of a data warehouse, if you will, that confirms the bilateral credit default swap trades that take place or the transactions that occur in the credit default swap market. Um, we have access to single name credit default swaps, all the index products, as well as index tranches. Right? So we have complete activity going back almost to the inception of this market, essentially when it was reported in DTCC. Um, so we have single name, we have firms, we have sovereigns, we have quite a bit of data. Right? That is non-public. Um, one of the things that when I'm looking at Dick, 
and I look at Jonathan back in the back of the room, that I would really love to see OFR do, which I think would really help our ability to regulate in this space, is that because we are only allowed to see, we're only allowed to see a subset of the data. That subset of data is actually the vast majority of all trades. What we, but we are not allowed to see particular parts of the credit default swap market. And the piece that we are unable to take a look at are what are referred to as the F cubes. And that would be foreign entities transacting on foreign names, which could have important systemic risk implications. So the F cubes would be the UK affiliate of Goldman Sachs transacting with UBS, London office, on a French bank, right? That is an important part of the systemic risk puzzle that is currently missing from the data we receive, but if we're expected to form opinions on systemic risk, you need to see the entire picture. And so that's a piece of the puzzle I would love to see the OFR be able to capture on, on the behalf of regulators. I think the Fed would also appreciate that. Um, so that's, those, that's the data we have. Now, as a part of the Dodd-Frank Act, the non-public data that has been provided to us at some point will become available to the public because the Dodd-Frank legislation has basically mandated the essentially the creation of swap data repositories. So real-time reporting of swap transactions will be made available to investors in the same way transactions would be on any type of, a, of an exchange. And that has required a huge amount of infrastructure to be built. What you're essentially doing is you are taking a complete over the count, an overcount of the market that's characterized by bilateral transactions. It's creating significant counterparty risk, and you're saying, let's try to consolidate this and make it look a lot more like an exchange. And the first requirement to do that is to mandate central clearing. So you create central clearing. After you get central clearing, the next thing to do is to say, well, there's a lot of examples where central clearing occurs, but it doesn't really happen in a completely transparent manner. Right, I'd say the trace data is an example of a facility like that. So the next thing that is mandated by Dodd-Frank is essentially put that in a transparent mechanism by creating swap execution facilities. Swap execution facilities are platforms on which prices are displayed and it allows end users of credit default swaps to have an opportunity to, in some sense, price shop. But the idea of creating a swap execution facility, now that you have a quasi-exchange created, it becomes that the next step is to require that data to then be fed into a swap data repository. And so this requires a massive amount of, of regulation in order to stand this up. And that's really what many of the rules that have been promulgated under Dodd-Frank Act in the Title VII space are designed to do. And it's an incredibly complicated, complex process where we work through all kinds of fantastically interesting research ideas along the way. One of the things that we have to address at the SEC is something as simple as what's a block trade? How big should a block trade be? Well, this is an opaque market. How do you determine what the size of a block trade should be? What type of an experiment would you set up to actually characterize or find out or discover or infer what a block size should be? It's an important part of a functioning exchange because there really isn't that much volume in these transactions. There's a lot of quoting, right? If you were to look at the market data source, you'd see there are a lot of contracts that exist. But when you actually ask how much trading takes place on a given day, it really isn't that much trading. And so when you have that little bit of trading, if someone has to, if a dealer has to take a large position, that dealer has to find a way to maybe offset that position. Well, if you have, are mandating real-time reporting and you have a very small block trade size, the other dealers can front run ahead of that, right? So it will impede trading and eventually the development of the market. So these are, I think, the types of issues that we have to look at at the SEC as this data is all consolidated and as we get more data, one of the things that we do is we look at the linkages. How do you identify systemic risk? Well, one thing you can do is you can look at the linkages across these different markets. 
are bank holding companies selling protection or buying protection? Mm -hmm. Are they trying to offset risk in their loan portfolios by buying credit default swaps on the, the names that they're lending to? Right? Would that be a conflict of interest? Would, are they selling protection? Are they, in a sense, doubling down and taking more of the risk on the same parties they're lending to? These are all things that create systemic implications that currently we know very little or next to nothing about, but in order to really regulate in this space, I think you have to have very solid ideas of where you want to go with this. So I'll close it off there, Charles. And Craig, thanks very much. Very good. Very interesting.